there's a big disconnect thinking that we are separate from nature, but we're very much part of nature. And I'm really passionate about bringing forth this kind of consciousness or higher consciousness that we cultivate as yoga teachers off the mat. Yoga and environmentalism are very closely related because it's ultimately about how do we take this practice out into the world off the mat to make the world a better place by our mindfulness. Hi, I'm Derek Mills. Welcome to the Globe Podcast. Goalie Gabe connects mind, body, and earth in this conversation with our guest host, Rachel Autumn. Goalie and Rachel speak about Goalie's therapeutic experiences with Kundalini and Yoga Nidra. And as their conversation unfolds, they connect the dots to suggest how the yoga practice might help us live more sustainably on our planet. I hope you enjoy this fascinating conversation about mental health, healing, and conscious environmentalism. Now over to Rachel to introduce Goalie to start the episode. Welcome Goli Gabe, who is an innovative leader in the field of mind-body wellness. With 24 years of teaching experience, Goli has created a groundbreaking system of yoga for mental health that integrates somatic therapy, mindfulness, yoga nidra, and meditation with neuroscience. Her unmatched superpower to transform stress and anxiety into tranquility makes her a sought-after keynote speaker in the field. Goalie's expertise has touched the lives of countless individuals and organizations, including companies, over 40 universities, psychological recovery centers, celebrities, and even royalty. Goalie is also a visionary sustainability consultant with over 20 years of experience designing innovative environmental programs and public education campaigns for government agencies, companies, and NGOs. Thank you so much, Goalie, for being here. We are so excited to welcome you to the GLOW podcast today. I'm so excited to be with you, Rachel. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. It's an honor. We recently built a connection. I guess this kind of gets to serve as your DJ debut as well, because (laughs) we met in DJing school at the Scratch Academy, um, where we have been diving into music theory and mixing. um, And we immediately found a connection on the healing power of music and got to chat and realize that we have so many overlapping interests in that Goalie, you actually have a connection to the GLOW community. Back in the day, the OG GLOW community, can you talk a little bit (laughs) about your experience with GLOW in the past? Of course. Um, I used to, I don't know, it was a decade ago or so, uh, practice in the Santa Monica GLOW studio. And, you know, I mean, GLOW is, has the, many of my friends are teachers and it's, has the best teachers, I think, in the whole world as part of the faculty there, you know, and I love uh, Derek and Lisa and Ryan, um, really special humans. And they, they've they really built this incredible, I think, uh, resource um, for well-being and fitness and yoga and meditation and mindfulness. And I've always been a, a fan and was actually, like I said, in in studio during many of the filming back in the back in the OG days. So I'm I'm really honored to be here. Oh man, we're so excited to have you. And I know um Derek is I got to chat with Derek and Derek is really excited to have you on the platform and just Thank have this so beautiful much. full circle moment with you. I really believe that like attracts like. So it makes sense that you would have found glow and all the work that you do. I would love to get into your journey in mental health, music, wellness, sustainability. Can you elaborate about your journey in mental health? Sure. It's a, it's actually a personal, very personal story. So I had started with my yoga practice when I was in college. Um, and I actually had like a profound Kundalini awakening in one of my very first classes, which was really amazing. But many years, uh, many years after that, I was actually diagnosed with thyroid cancer by, uh, you know, my mom saw like a lump in my throat when I was laughing one night at my parents' home. 
and in the desperation for kind of seeking a healing modality, she took me to a private kundalini yoga session with a wow. teacher all dressed in white with a beard. And while I had done yoga before, like I said, Rachel, in the in this state of acute, you know, trauma that I was facing with this new diagnosis, I had such a profound experience following that session with him, with the private uh, teacher, that I was blown away. I was like, I can feel like this. And I felt that in those 90 minutes, I transcended, even for a short period of time, like my diagnosis at the time. And I felt such a profound state of peace and well-being that I never attained from religion, you know, or temple. Um, and I knew that, and I became really a devout student and I practiced regularly and regularly until I was called to teach when I was on a mountaintop in New Mexico on a yoga retreat. And when I began teaching, this is back in 2000, if you can believe it. So to this date, 25, 24 years ago, um, I knew that I wanted to, I, I wanted to, explore teaching and really give and contribute um, to people that really needed it most. And so very early on, I applied yoga and meditation. I called UCLA Medical Center and said, I'm a new teacher and how can I help the patients there? And I did. Um, a doctor by the name of Dr. Emron Meyer was like the head of UCLA's Collaborative Centers for Integrative Medicine. And he brought me on and I started working with patients. Um, and then I went into, uh, for 13 years, I worked at psychological rehab facilities right here in the Pacific Palisades and Santa Monica and started working with people with acute trauma, anxiety, depression, eating disorders, post-traumatic stress. Um, and in that place, I started, uh, de I developed a system basically that worked time and time again because everyone came into session bringing an array of different issues and it was a lot of different energy and different, different traumatic backgrounds and I had to hone it all in and create a cohesiveness. And so by trial and error, working with such different you know, people and issues, I developed a system of healing that really is, is pretty simple. I mean, it, 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 it was bringing in yoga, meditation, mindfulness, somatic therapy, um, but a particular sequence that always ended in yoga nidra. And I found that it was incredibly effective. And when I would ask the clients, you know, who feels, who feels their depression, who feels anxiety, no one would raise their hand because they were in this such a state of relaxation and calm, even from one session. And that experience was so profound because I found that even in this really delicate population of acute trauma for many of people, people that had like suicidal ideation prior to coming into treatment, that by teaching them the skills of well-being, calm, coherence, connection with their heart, connection with their spirit, many have never had that kind of connection to themselves. Many had associated their entire identity similar to what I had with their diagnosis. Like you are the anxious one, you know, you're, you're depressed and they become that in their identity. And through the beauty, as you know, of the yoga practice to have this experience of their true essence that was beyond trauma, beyond depression, beyond anxiety, beyond their so-called diagnosis and into who they really were. That was amazing to me. It was so beautiful and that, which is why I stayed for so long. And what I found, and this is back again in the, 
I, I want to say like, you know, mid 2000s <laughs> in year that the repetition of the practice of repeating, bringing people into this place of calm. And just like when we work out and we go to the gym, the repetition of going to the gym over the course of, let's say, 40 days, by the end of the 40 days, you're like, man, I'm, I'm ripped. Look <laughs> at my abs. Look at my biceps. Look at my shoulders. I'm ripped because the repetition brought forth this profound transformation. And similarly, in the realm of mental health and well-being, the repetition of teaching our nervous system to be calm and relaxed, of teaching the mind to become still and focused, and teaching the body to come into that place of calm, again, from fight or flight into the parasympathetic state, brought forth sustained healing and transformation. Because as I learned later in life, like now in recent years, neuroscience now brought forth the science behind what is actually happening in our brain when we practice these practices repetitively is that we're literally rewiring our neural pathways, you know, changing that default net network, the amygdala of the brain shrinks and becomes smaller, the prefrontal cortex and the hippocampus becomes larger, and we're literally restructuring our brain and body and nervous system into this place of balance and calm, well-being, ease, peace, greater concentration, greater memory, and just connection with our true self. So that's how I got into it. <laughs> oh, that's such a beautiful story and testimony. Thank you for, for sharing that part of your journey and how you transmuted um, something that was such a, a challenge in your life. And you've not yeah. only supported and healed yourself, but you've helped to support and um, help people activate that gift within each of us that can heal ourselves. And um, I'm so grateful for the work that you do and contribute. Thank you. Of course. Can you share a little bit more about the specific sequence that you mentioned that you saw, like what, what, the, what that process is like that you've been using with clients or you were using at that time? Sure. Um, so I always, you know, I admired like even in yoga glow, the handstand yogis and, you know, the, and, and I love a rigorous practice and I love a vinyasa practice and I would say that, and while I can teach that for this specific population, I would say it's a more trauma-informed yoga therapy, and yoga therapy uses all the beautiful gifts of yoga, but for a specific, um, you know, ailment or imbalance, if you will, um, it's more just therapeutically oriented. So even the words that I use when I teach was specific to anxiety and depression and trauma, you know, the, and the particular sequence that I still teach today, even with, you know, healthy, healthy people that aren't struggling with an issue is, uh, I would say it's like a four, um, four step uh, system and the first step is just coming and observing how we're walking in into the into our mats you know observing the chatter in the mind that we all have uh just from this fast paced world and our you know digital world observing the tension in the body observing the disconnect again that i imagine we all have particularly those those of us that live in these fast-paced cities like Los Angeles, we're all like on the go and on the go. And um, so just noticing and observing and connecting with that in a, in a, you know, this is the mindfulness component, getting in touch. And then through the breath and gentle stretches to begin, we start to, you know, we start the process of creating shift. And so I start with kind of gentle opening sequence leading to a more vigorous like vinyasa practice, if that's appropriate for the clients. And for me, the flow yoga and the more rigorous practice 
is almost like kneading dough before you bake it. It's just working the kinks out of the body, the tension that we're storing. The If we're sitting at a desk all day, if we're driving a car all day, is, you know, getting the body warmed up and lubricated because the preparation for the body for me, then the cool down, you know, then I'll bring them down into the cool down poses. And in the cooling poses, for me, a lot of times, like a hip opener forward bend, uh, I'll teach a particular type of breath, you know, usually like extra long exhale breath, so that the cooling sequence becomes not only like let's, you know, really cool into, you know, relax the hamstrings or open up the hips, but you start to really calm the mind. So by the the forward bends, by the cooling, but also by the extra long, deep exhales. And I always bring a little bit of the Kundalini essence to focus on the third eye center. We start to calm the mind. My peak pose is the yoga nidra. So all of this has prepared the body for the progressive relaxation um, that then helps the client or participant really you become so relaxed that you transcend the trauma you transcend the anxiety you transcend your diagnosis your identity you know and you go so beyond that into this incredible place of peace and calm and for me that's the gold of the practice and then the fourth part is when they come out of that is just to observe how amazing they feel. Wow. They observe wow. the shift in the mind, observe the connection to spirit, observe the coherence between uh, mind, heart, body, and spirit and nervous system. Thank you for sharing that, that process. I think so many of our yoga practices go on that arc, but we don't always... Um, realize like that's what's happening. And so much of your work uses the body as a bridge to support the mental health. It's like the body is the gateway. Am, am I Absolutely. correct? Yeah, I think. yeah, exactly. And with that, would you say when, when you arrive in that yoga nidra space, um, you and I had a conversation before this, and you were talking about the concept of dissolving um, polarities, I believe you used dissolving yeah. polarities. Can you get into that a little bit, like the polarities between what we think our experience is and what it is, the differences that we see amongst ourselves and each other? What is that for you? For me, I, I, the, I mean, I think Yoga Nidra is like the gift of the gods for the human experience. And where even between our mind and body, sometimes there's polarity. Again, when I mention, even for myself, like running around as a single parent and doing all the things and running from this place to that place and getting the work done and the to-do list. And oftentimes we feel like our head is completely disconnected from our body. So right there, even in mind-body, even as a practitioner, I often feel disconnect. Um, we often feel as humans disconnected you know, or a polarity between our brain and our heart. You know, we're thinking our way out of things or we're thinking our way out of perhaps past trauma and that doesn't work. You know, you can't even talk or think your way out of these things. We often feel polarity, you know, I think as humanity, and we'll get, I know we'll dive into this shortly, I think for a lot of humans, there's a polarity, I, I would say unconscious, you, you know, people that are not on the conscious path, there's a polarity between man and nature, like we are separate from, and so therefore we'll destroy nature. So there's, I think that's a huge paradigm that's out there. And there's even polarity between like us and them. You know, I don't want to get into it, but the conflict in the world, the Israeli-Palestine, it's polarity, like we, us against them, all the war wars in the world, there's a, there's a false veil of polarity between us and the outside world or us and other religions, etc. And all of this 
in my experience with Yoga Nidra, with all walks of life, with all religions that I've worked with, with young and old and all races, is when we relax our body and we relax our mind so deeply, so deeply that we actually dissolve even the edges of our body. We come into this place where you become no mind, no body. And in that place of beautiful stillness, my experience has been that you literally, yeah, transcend yourself, you transcend your body, you transcend all the noise in the mind, and you come into a place of oneness with all of life, with with nature, with with all that ever was, with all that is, and with the universe itself. And it's almost the fee- and the feeling is tangible and the feeling can be repeated every time we practice the yoga nidra and to then come back in our body and take that experience and memory with us that that awareness with us i think is the start of really helping to shift the consciousness of humanity goodness from this polarity into unity, into into this oneness, which is really something that I'm passionate about. When you talk about oneness and unity and how there's such a deep wisdom and transformative power with yoga nidra practices, can you just dive a little bit deeper into what some of those benefits are and how people um, you've seen experience this in, in real time? Sure, Rachel. So we live, uh, as we talked about earlier, in such a fast-paced world now. And, uh, you know, the inundation of just like digital content that you and I get, you know, just every human and young people, the there's one in four people struggling with like mental health issues right now. And I would argue that stress is just what's really chronic stress and daily stress. And this high level of cortisol is wreaking havoc on not only our physical bodies, but our mind. And, um, you know, stress is known to shrink perfectly healthy brain cells. And, um, you know, it, it affects our digestion, our sleep, it's disrupting our sleep, it's disrupting our immune system. Um, uh, our blood pressure, so many things, but it's also um, affecting our brain health. And so if stress is really consuming our society, then again, yoga nidra is is kind of this incredible um, healing modality that doesn't require any heavy, you know, any expensive material. It doesn't require anything at all. You lie down and you listen to the sound of your beautiful teacher's voice. And by entering this deep state of relaxation, I have actually experienced time and time again with my, the groups that I've led or the sessions that I've led, that if you become very, um, not only does it build like a heightened sensitivity to your own self-awareness of your body, um, but the key to healing in whatever it is, whatever ailment, when I worked at UCLA Medical Center, you know, when I speak to doctors, all the doctors said that most of the health issues that people seek medical advice, the root is anxiety or stress. And that's what start, the cortisol starts to, you know, do crazy things in our body. And so deep relaxation is incredibly healing, bringing our nervous system from the sympathetic state into parasympathetic. And what, what I was saying earlier is that I can actually feel this reconfiguration, this healing taking place when I facilitate, like in the bodies of the people that I work with. And when I ask them, 
who can feel in that state that there's like this energetic reconfiguration, most people say, I can feel it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, uh, again, the repetition is that, you know, will shrink the amygdala in the brain, which is that, that worried, that primitive brain that is always like worried and in fight or flight, we shrink that, that portion of the brain, we grow the regions of the brain that uh, enhance our concentration, our memory, our focus, emotional regulation, less reactivity in our emotions. Because when we're stressed out and anxious, if someone just walks into the room and says like, the sky is blue, we might be reactive with them because that's what happens to our brain. But the relaxation response uh, creates an emotional stability, emotional regulation, more impulse control, heightened self-awareness. And now with the science backing all of this up, you know, it's said that deep relaxation doesn't just relax us, but we're actually affecting our body down to a cellular level, down to our DNA. And we can actually un- tangle if you even have a genetic disposition toward, I don't know, anxiety or depression or whatever, that we can undo uh, our genetic dispositions by the relaxation response. Like we, we can affect the epigenetics basically through these practices, through mindfulness, through meditation, through yoga nidra, through yoga. And that's incredibly exciting. It is. It is. And it's, it's true. I mean, I've spoken with and have encountered countless people who all have the same reflections, myself included. And there's this quote that I'm going to butcher, but it's about like, if you say that you're too busy to meditate, then you're, you need to meditate. (laughs) Exactly. Like we all um, have that obligation to ourselves and to the planet and how we show up to the world and in the world uh, to take deep care of ourselves and, I believe that's the connection to your work in sustainability as well. And taking in taking deep care of ourselves, we take deep care of one another, of the planet. Can we start to segue into your work in sustainability and how it connects to personal well-being? Sure. Absolutely, Rachel. So um, I... I often, you know, at the end of my yoga sessions, when we're coming into that place of it just everything feels soft, our heart feels softer, our mind is soft, and that relaxation is a very soft feeling. And when I bring people out, you know, from meditation, and we just look around the physical environment, even the world feels softer. And I often say, you know, imagine if the 9 billion people on the planet practiced with us, we would have a much more cooperative, loving, kinder, more compassionate world. And one that, that, that we are better caretakers of not of our own body, of our, of each other and of the planet as well. And that is the I I think that, you know, I often um, was hard on myself in the last 25 years saying, I wish I was just yoga and meditation, or I wish I was just sustainability. Why do I have these two passions? And now, you know, for me, it's mind, body, and earth. This, we have this human home that we need to take care of. And then we have our bigger earthly home. And the two are very much interconnected because what now we're to segue into that, what we're doing to the planet, we do to ourselves, you know, even as simple as we drink, uh, you know, we drink water from a plastic bottle and we know that plastic, there's so many images I think everyone has seen in Bali and elsewhere of, of, uh, and Asia of, you know, millions of plastic bottles like in riverways and in waterways and in the ocean. And we know that that's bad for the planet. And also recently, how does it tie back to human well-being? Well, um, BBC News just like two months ago put out a study that for every liter of water, there's like a quarter million 
microscopic microplastics that we're ingesting. So again, what we are doing to the planet harms us. Our well-being is intrinsically tied to the well-being of the planet. Um, if we're, uh, you know, cutting down trees and creating more climate emergencies, the world is becoming hotter. You know, in 20 years, that 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 is affecting us. That's affecting the the disappearance of species. It's going to it's going to affect us. I mean, every, everything that we do, the toxins in the food is coming back to us. The uh, toxins in like the fish, because we're putting toxins into the ocean, then we ingest the marine life, you know, that's going to harm us. So I think um, there's a big disconnect thinking that we are, again, separate from nature, but we're very much part of nature and I'm really passionate about bringing forth this kind of consciousness or higher consciousness that we cultivate as yoga teachers, you know, off the mat. Yoga and environmentalism are very closely related because it's ultimately about how do we take this practice out into the world off the mat to make the world a better place by our, you know, by our mindfulness. So it's not just about, oh, I meditated and now I'm going to go, you know, do this in the world. But it's like, how do we take that mindfulness and become these lights, these beacons of light in the world to to affect um, a more harmonious, unified, healthy planet for all beings, for all living beings, not just humans? I'm so grateful that you've connected the yoga to environmentalism and our role and taking our practice on the mat and letting that translate to our lives. Cause that's really what it's all about and what you're speaking to. And sometimes in essence, we lose a lot of that when we're in this like fast paced, go, go, go social media frenzy of like, this is this cool posture that I can do now. And we lose like the true heart of yoga and meeting and meaning of yoga. Yeah. When we speak about present day, modern age, everything being fast paced and with the damage that's done to our planet, not necessarily moving at a slow pace, we're seeing it actually expand at a more rapid pace now. But I think that the block for a lot of folks is that they don't see right away the damage that they're doing in their day-to-day -day action because the damage comes to the next generation or it comes however many years later. And we don't necessarily pay attention to things that don't affect us in the moment that not, not everyone but speaking pretty generally here what are some ways you think we could start to shift perspective around our daily action and our, our daily practices without necessarily seeing the outcome yet like what are some ways that we can reframe our relationship to what we do daily without receiving yet the benefit of the good that we're doing, just trusting that but when we do good, goodness will prevail. I have a lot. I have a lot, Rachel. <laughs> but um, one of the things I happen to bring a prop with me <laughs> is uh, we can do, you know, oftentimes I think these environmental uh, issues become so daunting for us as humans. Like, oh, what can my little action do for the earth? But if we think of, you know, one, one action times 8 billion people on the planet, if like 8 billion of the planet did this one little action, it's in tremendous, the impact. And so I have an, a, one really simple example people can, uh, can adopt right now. So you know how classically we were, we have um, toothbrushes. So these are obviously, these often end up either in landfills or in oceans. So a really simple swap that we can do is to cease buying plastic toothbrushes and instead buy these wonderful bamboo ones. This one has charcoal bristles, but this uh, bamboo is not only a re renewable resource, but at the end of its life, um, it's compostable. You can throw this in the fireplace <laughs> and it's... Um, it's much better than these that will stay on the earth forever. 
literally, and never biodegrade. So that's one swap. Um, yeah. uh, reducing seafood intake is uh, another one. I know, you know, sushi and seafood is delicious for many for many people. I I uh, think it's delicious as well. Uh, but reducing seafood because forty six percent of the plastic found in the ocean is from what's called ghost nets. Is all the fishing gear that uh, fishing you know fishing ships just toss behind when they're done. So all of that wreaks havoc on marine life and a lot of whales and dolphins and turtles and birds get stuck in the fishing gear that's left there, you know, for years. So 46% of all plastic pollution found in the ocean is from fishing and not only just fishing, you know, boats, but now we live in an industrial age, there are uh fishing boats called ocean trolleys it's called and they basically go into the ocean and they are bulldozing the entire bottom of the sea so whether there is coral kelp in there hundreds of species you know bottom feeders so and they'll just take everything and it's huge if i wish i had a visual for it but it is massive, massive. And they're going in Antarctica, they're going all over the world. And, uh, you know, for one fish species, maybe they're wanting, I don't know, cod, um, there's 40% of what they catch in these ginormous nets is thrown away. It's called bycatch. They don't even want it. So they're literally like raping the ocean from all of its life and throwing 40% of it, it's dead now, back into the sea. Um, it, it's horrifying what's happening. And so, you know, reducing our fish intake is really huge because if you look at industrial fishing fleets, it's, you know, mankind as intelligent as we are, we have been you know, we're intelligent and we either have the choice to use our intelligent for the good, but we're also using it for greed and for short-term gain. And unfortunately, especially when it comes to the environment, there is a lot of greed. There's a lot of short-term profit. And it is said that the oceans are, uh, scientists are predicting that will become fishless by 2050 unless something is done. Wow. That is insane. That is, it's insane. That's It's insane. Wow. So reducing fish, um, uh, looking at labels and uh, looking at palm oil is really prevalent in everything from crackers to chips, uh, not that those are healthy anyway, to soaps, to beauty products. And palm oil plantations are really devastating to the environment because most of the Asian countries were clear cutting and slashing and burning beautiful rainforests and forests, um, particularly where the Sumatran tigers and elephants and orangutans um, and countless other species live. And so we're wiping that out to plant these monocrops for these really cheap oil, basically, that is just destroying forests. So being aware of reading labels, avoiding palm oil, um, uh, shopping in our closets, I call it. I mean, of course, we all get a nice dopamine from wearing something new, and I'm not saying never do that, but we also, in the Western world, we all have so much right? We all have more than enough. And, you know, mixing and matching and playing, I think a lot of fashion, there's so much fast fashion, I think we're throwing away, we're landfilling like one uh, a garbage truck of textile waste a minute in New York City alone. You know, so there's so much waste that comes with fast fashion, you know, um, with just the fashion industry and 
shopping in our closet, using what we can, what we, using what we already have, because again, we all have more than enough in our homes, in our closets, and asking ourselves, do I really need that? And can I be creative and come up with the cutest outfit that I just mix and match something that was amazing from a couple years ago with something maybe newer and not buying excessively because and not white wasting excessively. You know, waste is a huge issue that I'm very passionate about. Um, putting animals off our plates and out of our closets is a huge one. Billions of animals are not only farmed for food, and that we can talk about an hour in and of itself, the ramifications of animal agriculture, on the environment is huge and also in fashion. You know, animals used for leather and fur and feathers and their skins is incredibly devastating. Many of these animals never see the light of day until they are on the trucks about to be slaughtered. Uh, they are, you know, chickens are li living in crowded cages um, there's antibiotic issues with factory farms, making us resistant to antibiotics because um, they're, they're in such cramped places that the farmers have to feed them with antibiotics so that they don't spread disease. But then that, again, the connection that that impacts us. Yes. And it's, yeah, animal agriculture is probably the most devastating thing on the planet for forests because we have to clear cut and burn forests to make space for pasture land and for the food to grow animals so again like football fields of forests are burned down every minute just to transition that land into pasture land the impact on our waterways and oceans because this is gross, but it's real. The manure from factory farms goes somewhere. And oftentimes, all the time, it ends up in our waterways. So in the Gulf of Mexico, for example, all the farming that we do in uh, middle America is going down the Mississippi rip River into the Gulf of Mexico. And the Gulf of Mexico is now the largest, what's called ocean dead zone in the world, where all the fish float to the float to the top and they die. There was another BBC thing uh, uh, documenting this a couple of months ago, and it's because they there's so much nutrient from the factory farms in the oceans that there's no life there. And again, that impacts us. You know, we're not this isolated thing on the climate. So every time we're clearing land for, we're deforesting it to make pasture land for cows, we're diminishing not only the trees, which is the cooling cover of the earth. That's why we have all the climate emergencies in Australia, um, in Asia, in Europe. Europe was the hottest year that we had ever in 2024. Why? Because we're continuing to clear the forests for animal agriculture, for logging, but primarily for animal agriculture. Um, uh, climate, uh, by, and, and as when we clear the forests, so every time we wipe out this beautiful, lush, old growth forest filled with, you know, monkeys and parrots and mammals and insects and flora and fauna, that's all wiped out, it does two things. We also lose this incredible biodiversity of the earth that makes earth magical. It's because we have this incredible beauty of the planet that makes earth so magical. We're making it barren. So we're losing this precious biodiversity that we can never mimic and bring forth. And when we lose biodiversity and we're wiping out the homes of these animals and birds, it's leading into species extinction. So right now on our clock in our lifetime, it is said that we're entering 
the next mass, you know, it's one million species are on the verge of extinction due to human activity right now. So adopting a plant-based diet, again, I'm not, we don't have to be perfect at it, but doing our best to reduce our meat and dairy intake and adopting more plants, more vegetables, more tofu, more legumes. And do you know what that does? It's actually scientifically proven to make us healthier. Yes, man. Wow. I'm going to take a breath with that, that information. No, because it's so important to share this. I think that a lot of us exist in our bubbles or exist in the bubble of the community that we're in. And we are not always exposed to or aware of everything that's going on in the world. And um, it's so important to highlight this. And sometimes it can be icky and scary. And like you mm -hmm. said, a little gross, but it's the truth of the matter. And at the end of the day, we're all contributors of this and to to know better is to then be charged with the act of doing better and so much of what we were talking about earlier is so essential in in giving yourself that experience of of rising to the occasion mm -hmm. of your life and rising to the responsibility of shining your light and being your best self and how that connects to our collective responsibility and healing ourselves, our planet. And so I'm so grateful that you have, you've allowed yourself to be multi hyphenate, multifaceted, mm -hmm. because so many of us that have different interests, we do feel like we're supposed to do it like this or be one thing. And by you connecting the dots, it actually creates, it creates the opportunity for people to, to deepen their practice, to deepen their self-awareness, how do, how do they then move into the world and impact the world in a better way? So thank you so much for sharing all of this. It's you're, essential. You're welcome. It's thank essential. You, I, I, something is brewing in me that I wanted to tie it back. So the, the way what I just shared, and I know that it was a lot and it's heavy, it's not light, it's intense and it's real and it's what's happening is that you know, how it relates to yoga is that one of the principles of yoga is ahimsa, is non-harming, non-harming to ourself and non-harming to others. And for this reason, you know, I, for me, many, many years ago, I think when I started kind of going plant-based 20 years ago, thanks to one of my early yoga teachers, um, it is... I think, uh, you know, anyway, it, it's such a beautiful parallel to yoga because how we lead as yoga teachers and practitioners in the world is how am I leading by example? And I personally don't want to contribute to the violence and suffering of another living being to the best of my ability you know, am I perfect? No. Are we perfect? No. There's no judgment, but can we lead by example to cultivate a more kind, compassionate, considerate, respectful world for all living beings? And for me, like as a yogi and as an environmentalist, it just really made sense, like for my heart to, to lead my life and my plate from my heart um uh you know rather again thinking like oh this for this five minute meal like well what did it take for this animal to be on our plate a lot a lot and there's so many more ramifications that i won't get into you know the impact on wildlife like wolves horses they're being wiped out again because of farming interests so the, 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 the impacts are so huge for, I'm sorry, there are so far, uh, why the impacts are so widespread and, um, but leading it back to the yoga practice, you know, it really aligns with ahimsa and non-harming, which is one of the principles in yoga philosophy.
thank you for sharing these pillars of mindful living. And I know that you are actually in process. You are in an incubator season of creating a book, a guide for us to tap into daily practices that we can do to support and be stewards of the earth. Can you share a little bit about this project that's coming up and any insights, any teasers that you would offer at this time about what we can expect from your offering to the world? Sure, uh, Rachel. So um, initially, I was going to make like a really simple guide, you know, like a real simple, like you can flip through it guide to sustainable living to make it really easy for everyone. Because as we spoke about, it is daunting for most people to be like, oh, well, what can I do? So forget it. I'm just not going to do anything. And I wanted to make something really practical and easy and accessible. And I may still do the guide, like little snippets of like, here's a hundred things that you could do that really make a big impact, like as simple as the toothbrush. Like imagine times 9 billion people, that's 9 billion plastic particles that don't enter our waterways or landfills. So every little thing really counts. Oh, I, ha I have another one. So here's plastic shampoo and conditioner bottles. So another like really simple thing that we could do is to um, stop buying this and instead use a shampoo bar. It smells amazing, this one. And at the end of the life, hold on, I got to put this down. At the end of the life of a shampoo bar, you know, this uh, can be compostable and the bar itself will disappear. So it's literally like zero waste, which is amazing. Again, imagine if even 100,000 people adopted this, it would be, you know, 100,000 shampoo bottles that don't end up in the landfill. And speaking, speaking of plastic, you know, of all the plastic ever produced, I'm an avid recycler, but the truth of the matter is that only less than 9% of plastic is actually ever recycled. It's kind of a sham that the industry made to make us feel better, but it's not really, it's just not really done, sadly. Goodness. So what's happening? What is actually happening with recyclables then? We don't really know. Again, I, I still do it. You know, I still do it with the, in the hope that it is, but I think a lot of it is shipped to third world countries Jeez. right now. Jeez. Yeah. So, so the, and I only bring that again, it's, it's heavy. It's not fun to think about that. It's a lot of plastic. I, I have a lot, you know, every time we have a yogurt tub or whatever, plant-based yogurt, uh, it, it, again, it's a plastic drug. So I'm, I'm trying to come up with just ways to reduce, and this is one way. So in the book, just back to the book, all the things that I try to do or I even think about that I don't even want to post about because some of the stuff is daunting or not pretty to look at, I was like, you know what? I'm just going to write it all out and make it really accessible and simple and like everything that we do from the clothes that we wear um, to uh, uh, even our yoga clothes has microplastic in it. You know, all the nylon, uh, it's all made from petrochemicals. I mean, so I, I kind of laid it all out and um, from, from everything of like how to reuse stuff, like you want to get rid of you, your old couch and you, you just don't want it anymore. Instead of dumping it on the street, which I see on my street, like every day, people dumping bulky items, you put an ad in Craigslist and you're like free item. And like 20 people want the item that you don't want. And it gives it a new life. So I just give like really clear, easy to follow solutions to like everyday things that we do. Everyday things from buying recycled content, toilet paper, and, you know, like how that affects our forests. And I just make, I, I laid it all out in an in a easy to follow format that gives you the education of the why, you know, what the issue is and, and the solution, what you can do to make it better. And so that's coming up hopefully in a couple of months. I might, I might make it a digital book because I want it to be zero waste. Ah, 
Of course. Um, I'm so excited for this. This is, it's because it's what you just spoke to um, just now about the solution oriented approach, because it can get real heavy, real fast. And so yes. presenting opportunities for us to contribute to a better world, a better way of living, a more mindful way of living feels so empowering and feels like something that you can sustain and, yes. and keep up with and grow. And I'm uh, imagining too, that this is all kind of like the concept of stacking your habits, habit stacking. So kind of switching one thing in your daily practice. And then after you, that's second nature, the bamboo toothbrush is your new thing. <laughs> then maybe now we can start to move on to a new sector of our life. It's not a total exactly. change and disruption of your life. It's, it's an invitation to deepen your awareness. And as you become more aware and in yourself and in your contributions to the world for the good, hopefully you're able to then rise and make some subtle shifts. Exactly, Rachel. Yeah, making making it easy, just like even adopting a meditation practice, you know, you could start with like one minute a day. Yes. You know, and that one minute, you're like, oh, I could do this. And then maybe, you know, lead, uh, like build it up to 15 minutes eventually, yes. and then maybe 20 minutes and maybe half an hour. And it's the same with the sustainability, uh, sustainable living tips. It's like, maybe you just start with one or two things, but the book is going to offer you a lot. And I think by gaining the awareness, like even, you know, I, I even have chapters in the book on like adopting pets instead of buying from breeders, you know, and what that entails. And I think a lot of people just don't have the awareness of their actions and in the hopes of bringing the awareness forward on the table, we can, as a society, make more informed and conscious choices um, that are also, again, more heart-centered, Yes, you know, more kind and compassionate. Yeah, it makes me excited. I'm seeing the world of 9 billion people adopting this one thing. Like you sharing that, it it really, the scale of the difference that we can make feels so much more attainable. And it, again, it's that concept of dissolving polarities. Like we're all connected. Yeah. We're all connected. We're all connected. Exactly. Exactly. It's a science. Like we... You, we all, you know, we all, I have a little snippet in the book, actually, that talks about our genetic um, commonality with all the other species of life. Like it's pretty, we're really deeply connect, interconnected with, with all organisms on this earth. And so, you know, we, I, I really want us as humans to rise into that and begin to shift because it's not the the planet doesn't need to be saved the planet is incredibly wise and has had its natural checks and balances for billions of years before we even came on it <laughs> it's human consciousness that needs to be saved and needs to be shifted into a different mindset from domination and greed and like short-term gain to this like heart-centered, which is very yoga, you know, yoga-esque, more heart-centered. How can I contribute? How can I make a difference? How can I leave the earth better than I found it? Um, and uh, honoring like that interconnection, having reverence and love for this incredibly beautiful gem of a planet that like just the magic that it is just the perfect distance from the sun compared to all the other planets to hold this gorgeous life that we see when we travel you're like oh my god it's not like it's not that brazil is beautiful or the maldives is beautiful or tahiti is beautiful it's the earth is beautiful yes the earth is magnificent and one of the things in the book that I hope is to leave readers with this reverence to lead, start leading every day to have like awe and respect and love and reverence for the world, for the, for the world, for each other, 
for the earth, for all living beings. Uh, blessings to you for that. It's We're all mirrors of each other. And again, how we're treating the earth. Like you said, we started this discussion about sustainability with how we're treating ourselves is reflected in how we're treating the earth. And so many of the things that you spoke to and the harm that has been done to the earth by humankind has been things that aren't healthy for us, like things that science has already proven. Yeah. Palm oil consumption. We've already seen all of the studies on on plant-based nutrition. And these things are equally as beneficial to us as it is to implementing exactly. for the planet. So the interconnectedness of it all is so transformative and encouraging. And I hope those listening feel encouraged to play their part in their self-healing and in the recalibration of our connection to the planet so that the planet can be its resilient self and self-heal as well. And and I think um, rather than, again, having like dominion on all these other species that we're caging and mutilating and harming, like true, the true meaning is stewardship is being caretakers you know guardians guardians of the planet and for me that's the that's always been a north star since i was it's in my dna like it's something like intrinsic in my and knowing in my soul that that's what at least that's what i'd like to inspire on this lifetime is a, a stewardship is a guardianship of the earth because I truly have like awe and reverence and, you know, I don't expect everyone to be like me, but I just hope to inspire just the respect for life, you know, respect yes. for other life forms, be it tree, animal, you know, other human, um, and, you know, all of the ocean, all, all of it. Um, so, and I, I think it's possible. And I think, um, I don't know, like if we take it back to music, <laughs> Rachel, you know, the the joy that people have like dancing together in community is that I think ultimately when we transcend that disconnect, we all like that is like, why is it that people love dancing and people love music? It's because we're gathering in collective, in harmony with the earth in that moment, with each other, with music, with the vibration, you know? So I think deep down, like it's there for everybody, but we've just kind of forgotten. Yes. Yes. And that's why we, we both are DJs now. Yeah. <laughs> yes, girl. It's so fun. I love it. Yeah. Well, Cause DJs, it's, it's a little deviation, but it's so connected it to this conversation. Um, because it's a it's a vibe curator. A DJ exactly. is a vibe curator, is a moment maker. It's it's a totally. heartbeat of a party. And as someone who gets to be that MC, that master of, yes. of ceremony, you get to establish the vibe. So having DJs even who are high vibrational beings who are tapped yes. into self care and deep care and wisdom for another that sets the tone and the vibration of how we're all going to connect and it's why having music in a positive um, light positive messaging positive community uh, my dad grew up in Baltimore Maryland where I'm from and he used to he raves about this club called Odell's it's like it's like studio 54 of of Baltimore, Maryland. <laughs> and it was an alcohol free establishment. So they could stay open till the wee hours of the morning. Cause they didn't have to have a liquor license and there weren't any limitations. And right. it was just, everyone was high on life and on the vibration yeah. on the dance. And I want to see more of that today. And I know you're, you're tapped into that same frequency too. Totally. With everything that you do. Um, this is a great like opportunity to hold space with you and amplify your work and your vision for the planet and for what it is that you want to contribute that you already have contributed. So 
I am honored that you shared space with me here today at the Glow oh, Podcast. This work you. will touch the hearts of many. I want to end today with a really fun rapid fire round. Sure. A handful of questions that you'll respond to from the heart. Speaking of music, I want to start with this. I'm curious what your favorite song or genre of music is to practice yoga to, if any, if you practice with yeah, music. Yeah, definitely have one. So I love, you know, whether I teach or practice, I love uh, melodic ambient music, I would say is my favorite. Yeah. Electronic ambient music, but really melodic, beautiful, kind of takes you on a journey. It's my favorite. Yes, same. With. And yeah, oh, good. And music, just back to the music piece, um, Rachel, music has always, in. I always selected the music for my, when I teach first, and the music informed the vibration and the frequency and the vision of what I wanted to teach. It was always music first for me before, like I designed my sequence or what I was going to speak about or share. So music is like, yeah, the holding space yeah. for me, the container of like where I wanted to take a client like on their journey. I'm, I'm so right powerful. there. I'm right there with you, yeah. sister. <laughs> um, okay. Well, what's your favorite genre of music to dance to? I think I have a suspicion oh. based on your <laughs> DJ preferences. I think you're a house music like yeah. all day. Just, that might be wrong. Yes, you're. You're right. Again, like I love ambient, but for, of course for dance, um, I love deep house, Afro house. Um, it's been maybe a couple years. Latin house is really big. You know, some of my favorite DJs kind of music out of Berlin, like they're really pushing the, the Latin house lately. And there's some like amazing um, tracks coming out that are so exciting. But I love, yeah, just the high vibration music. But I also, I love the deep house also. Some of the, uh, the music that kind of takes us like on this melodic journey as well. I like the deep stuff as well. Yes. And you're, those, those three. I was going to say you're a great um, DJ in this category yeah. as well. I've gotten a little yeah. taste, a little preview. More Thank on that you. soon. My first, my first ever, our, our little Academy graduation. Yeah. That, that we did. Fun times. You had to be there. Okay. <laughs> what is the best eco-friendly habit that you've adopted recently? Uh, I mean, recently, it's not recent, the, the best one that I've adopted, I mean, I've been mostly plant-based for like 20 years. And I, as I mentioned earlier, I truly believe that it's the most powerful. I have a whole keynote talk on it, actually. I have a whole workshop on it. From the research that I've done in this field, it's the most powerful action that we can take as individuals to better protect the planet, the forest, the climate, the waterways, the air. Um, so that's, you know, I wouldn't, I, it's not recent, um, but it's a long time. And then uh, more recent, I would say, yeah, the shampoo bar is a very recent thing. I wish I did it earlier. Um, and I'm eliminating like all the bulky plastic and the bamboo toothbrush is like a couple years that I've done it. I'm like, why didn't I think of this earlier? I know. I'm constantly thinking like Shark Tank ideas when I yeah. see people coming up with really clever ways of of doing things better and protecting the earth. I'm like, ah, I should have come up with that myself. Okay. Oh. <laughs> Final question. I have two more for you. Um, sure. Is there a book or a resource that you would recommend folks who are kind of at the beginning of their awareness on sustainability? Um. I would say keep on the lookout for my my upcoming guide, whatever it's going to be, my e-guide, my e-book, because as I mentioned, I think it'll really just make it tangible, like really easy to follow, really easy um, to understand as far as what the issues are with all our everyday habits and practices, and then what the simple solutions are. And I talk about really everyday things from what to do with your old computers and, and phones that you don't want to, uh, you know, pets, lifestyle, food, fish, um, you know, ju just an understanding of our like everyday to fashion, to clothing, to waste. It covers everything um, 
Otherwise, I would say, uh, and I can provide this later, maybe on a link um, to follow maybe particular accounts on Instagram that I find to be really informative. Thank you. We appreciate that. And we'll definitely share those sure. in our show notes. You might have spoken to this already, but repetition is is power here. So sure. if, if it's the same answer, all good. Final question for you is, what is one small change you wish everyone would make for a greener planet? I did touch upon it already. I would definitely say, like I said, it's not small, but I would say adopting a plant-based diet is the the maybe even reducing um reducing meat and dairy consumption to you know if you're having it like seven days a week maybe reducing it to four days a week um meatless mondays is a thing and i there's so many i i can also put in the link so if people are used to eating meat like seven days a week or some kind of animal product reducing that to maybe four days a week and having plant-based options on those other days. And I, I follow an account on Instagram. Again, I'm happy to share that. It's so mind-blowingly delicious and they have recipes like every day. Like I, I drew, I save all of them. I'm like, Oh my God, it's so tasty what you're showing me. So, um, and from friends of mine that I've inspired through the years to adopt everyone feels better. They're like, Oh my God, like my mind is more clear. My, my body feels better. And Dr. Neil, Neil Barnard and Dr. Michael Greger, who are incredible scientists who are plant-based based MDs. There's countless others. They actually did a study. Like I think it was like 1500 individuals at a company uh, that um, it was a mental health study. And they, after two weeks of going plant-based, there was a reduced um, irritability, um, uh, anger, uh, depression, anxiety. Um, they felt, people felt better after two weeks in their mental health and wellness. And when I used to eat meat, when I was just starting my yoga practice, I had a personal experience of feeling emotionally better. My yoga teacher, um, said to me something, because I asked him, I said, Guru Singh, why is it that I wake up angry in the morning? This was like, it was in my 20s. There's like nothing in my life that I should feel angry about. He said, Goli, it's the meat that you're eating. And I said, well, why? And he said to me something that I'll never forget. The last thing that an animal feels before being slaughtered is <gasps> fear and adrenaline in their body and in their, you know, in their nervous system. And then we ingest that three times a day. And I literally felt that, that morph in my body in a strange way. And as soon as I listened to my yoga teacher, I stopped eating. It was chicken at the time. I felt better. I didn't feel, I feel peaceful in my being. So, um, and if not, if that just feels daunting, just go for the bamboo toothbrush. It's really simple. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate your shares so much. And it's, there's so many things that you can start anywhere, friends, like start anywhere, start today. I think that this is some powerful work that you're doing and it's exciting. And, it, and you're talking about the joy and the peace that comes from, yeah from this awareness and these applications to life as well. So it can be fun to it can be really, <laughs> it can be fun. really fun and, and really delicious. And, um, it's, a it's a way, cause I think most people, uh, you know, if you put a, a chicken or an apple in front of a child and say, which one do you want to eat? The child is going to go for the apple. You know, and I think intrinsically in our heart, we are good humans and we are loving people. And this is an expression for me to just lead with love, with my heart, you know, with what I put on my plate as well. Absolutely. So much love and reverence for you and your work and everything that you reflect out into the world. 
It's Thank you, Rachel. Such an honor to know you and grow with you, DJ Goli Gabe. <laughs> DJ Rachel. <laughs> I have so much more to say about the DJ round, but I know we're at time. I know. Oh man, it's it's a powerful thing. You're just gonna have to st- Stay in touch with us on the socials and see where, where DJ sure. Land takes us. But sure. my DJ name is DJ Autumn Rose. It's my middle name Woo. and my grandmother's name. And it's DJ Goli Gabe, because why would you have to change that fierce yeah, name? Exactly. <laughs> so thank you again, Goli. Such a, a pleasure, you, a treat. I'm excited to um, integrate some of your wisdom into my life today. Right. And I hope folks uh, will want to stay in touch with you, your work, looking out for your upcoming book or ebook. Your website is www.goligabay.com. You're on social at, at goligabay. Can you share yes. if there are any other places we can find you and stay in touch with you? Um, I mean, my SoundCloud is also at goligabay. If they want some music, I'll be I'll be sharing some mixes uh, soon on SoundCloud that I'm really excited about. Some high vibes, or I'm gonna, I'm actually going to do an ambient mix as well for some really deep relaxation, beautiful, you know, softening to the nervous system yes. frequencies there as well. But those are those are the best ways to get a hold of me, and I really. Uh, I really thank you, Rachel. I know when when I saw you, you were doing a back to back with one of our classmates, and I'm like, she's amazing. Who is this beautiful? Who is this beautiful, bright person? And Aww. then we talked, and we're like, oh, Yoga Glow. Yes, we have that in common. Yep, instant, instant connection, instant love. Instant connection. It was all meant to be. Just a, it was one more deviation. We actually weren't in the same class. You just happened to be practicing during my class, so that's. But then I how came to. Then I like slowly. I'm like, <laughs> I think I like them better. I want to come into this class. Yeah, you were exactly. the missing. You were the missing link in our group. I was. I was in my little cave in that room with the with the controller. Yeah. With the pioneer in my little room over there next to you guys. Uh. It's so much fun. So much fun. So much joy. Um, please check out Goalie's SoundCloud because this can be a great soundtrack to your your practice on the mat, off the mat, as you are kind of doing a, a cleanse, a purge in your home and starting to implement some new sustainable tools in your daily life. So thank you, Goalie, again. Thank you so much, Rachel. And sending you so You're much awesome. love and gratitude. I send you love too. You're the best. Thank you to our entire team behind the scenes at GLOW. I'm so grateful for your care and commitment to serving our members around the world. Thank you to our teachers for so beautifully sharing your gifts and talents. I'm also grateful to our lovely community of GLOW members. You've supported us since 2008, and because of you, we get to continue to do the work we love. It's the combined support of our team, our teachers, and our community that grants me the privilege to continue to bring you the GLOW podcast. Thank you to Lee Schneider at Red Cub Agency for production support. And the beautiful music you're hearing now is by Carrie Rodriguez and her husband, Luke Jacobs. And remember, take care of yourself because our world needs you. Thank you for coming on this journey with me. You can find the Glow Podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or glo.com slash podcast, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. I'm Derek Mills.